Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, Wendell, thank you very much uh, for, for taking the time. I do appreciate it, especially because it was kind of um, uh, short term, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think we, we connected on, was it Monday? And, and right. today, today we have this going on. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm a fan from when you played in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, my entire family is a fan for that matter. They're, uh, they're all saying hi, by the way. Um, all right, send it back for me, send it back. We'll, we'll do. And uh, so, yeah, I know your background, but maybe you could like go a little bit into it for um, maybe all the people who are not affiliated with European basketball, US national team basketball and Syracuse basketball. <laughs> um, we're going way back. Mm -hmm. um, let me start off by, by saying again, thanks for, for having me and, and taking the time. Um, my basketball career, I guess so part of the, from, from, from what people don't know prior to Berlin and what they've probably read, uh, I didn't start playing basketball until uh, around 14 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have uh, you know, a youth team or a um, uh, you know, club team or anything like that. I, I basically played in the streets with my friends uh, and it wasn't until around, uh, like I said, 14 years old, um, a friend of my father's that worked with my father uh, asked him, you know, saw me and said, oh, your son plays basketball? He says, uh, yeah, he plays out outside the street. He's like, no, no, does he play with a, with a club? And so if anyone's familiar with um, um, the Catholic Church, they have a league called CYO, Catholic Youth Organization. So every church has a team. And basically on Sundays, the teams play against each other. So just to give you an idea, Chris Mullen played in that league. Um, oh. You know, uh, numbers, numbers, of, numbers of players. Uh, you know, especially who lived in New York City area because it's, it's it's a New York um, mainly based kind of organization. So picture that as opposed to your uh, a club team. Mm -hmm. um, and this is before the you know the AAU explosion. Um, so any kind of organized sports were basically done through the church or, you know, a loose organization in different neighborhoods. They might have a basketball tournament and the kids will come out and play. So needless to say, I didn't start playing until I was around 14. And in my neighborhood, I didn't have a Catholic church. I had to take the train through that neighborhood. Um, first year I, I tried out, played, couldn't make, couldn't make it because I wasn't I wasn't from the, the parish. I wasn't from the neighborhood. The second year I did. Um, speeding through the story, the referee, a referee saw me play. He mentioned um, my name to um, Christ the King High School, uh, mm -hmm. the athletic director. Uh, speeding up again, that referee became my freshman coach at Christ the King. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's how it came to be. Uh, from my freshman year uh, to my senior year in high school, again, st uh, starting high school, 15 years old, um, you know, no organized ball, long, lanky, tr you know, trip over a crack in the street. That's how coordinated I was. <laughs> I, I, at the end of four years, I was receiving major offers from all, co all colleges around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously a vast and quick improvement over four years, which I attribute to, you know, the, the, the coaching I received and just playing, playing and playing nonstop all year round. Uh, get to Syracuse, um, highly recruited, and it was the, the, the mecca of Big East basketball. And I'm talking about, you know, Georgetown Hoyer, St. John Redmond, um, the Big East at its height. Every game is a slugfest, a fight, and, um, you know, I'm sure I'm showing up with a pocket knife at a gunfight. So needless to say, I was playing against the big boys every night, but I grew up very fast, um, whereby, you know, my senior year, I was a, a all-conference player and got drafted by the, the Warriors, uh, made it all the way to uh, the veterans camp, uh, was the last, last cut. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there started my European career in uh, Valladolid, Spain, in the um, Premier League in, in ACB. Um, so my great honor was to go to a team that was fighting 
to stay in first division from relegation. Mm -hmm. So I won't bore you with the details, but needless to say, we, we made the play out. Um, I had a great uh, play out series and the team stayed in first division. So I basically saved the spot for Sabonis to play the following years <laughs> after I did. Because um, he played with uh, Valladolid uh, before he played with Real Madrid uh, mm -hmm. before I got there. My next year, I did so well, I ended up playing with Real Madrid, you know, one of the top teams in, in, in Europe. And uh, we won the Korach Cup that year, um, finished second in the, in the, in the uh, Spanish League to Barcelona, uh, who was coached by none other than Aito uh, mm -hmm. at that time. So Aito is, is getting old. <laughs> um, he was a young guy back then. And um, as, as everyone knows, the rest of my career going on from there. Um, but in terms of um, my career, for one thing, I had to um, define it by was resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, meeting, as we were spoken about earlier, adversity, learning how to, uh, first of all, as a foreigner living in a foreign country, uh, may or may not know, luckily for me, I, I had a foundation in Spanish. So going from Spanish to Italian was pretty simple. You know, going from France to Israel was a different story. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a good foundation of languages, you know, may, understood a lot more maybe than I could speak, but at least I can communicate with my coaches, teammates, and, and have sort of a full relationship with the team as opposed to being just the American who spoke only English and want to know where the ketchup is. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, from going from place to place, from team to team, um, as a foreigner, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of other American players can understand, you're a higher gun. You have to come in, you have to read the, read the, uh, the faces, the attitudes, the tendencies, not only of the coach, but the players you're playing with. You know, I played on teams where there were national team players who thought they were the stars, and I had to massage it. And, you know, other places where everybody was under 21, and I mm -hmm. felt like a kindergarten teacher. So being in those situations obviously helped me in, one, learning how to communicate, how to deal with people, people of different cultures, different people of different attitudes and ideas, but also um, utilizing the work ethic that I received from playing in high school, playing in college. And it's funny that a lot of the lessons that you learn about hard work and resilience and, and, and you know, keep trying and when you fall down, get up and, and, and keep forging ahead, things will get better. All of those um, lessons learned came into play, of course, over the course of my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I remember when uh, when I played in college, we used to have like it wasn't it wasn't an exception basically to have like a seven hour practice. One time we had a nine hour practice. You know, we just we were in the gym all day because we we couldn't make a certain time on a drill. Mm -hmm. but obviously, the longer the drill went on, the worse, worse the time got. <laughs> we were never going to make it. And uh, but yeah, some of the, some of the things that happened in college, you know, when you when you look now and you read, you know, uh, uh, the coach from Wichita State, he resigned because of you know apparently the way allegedly what he did with some of his players. For me, that was normal. <laughs> yeah, you know, it taught you how it taught you how to deal with adversity. It taught you how to deal with with uh, excuse my language assholes, mm -hmm. um, because. As a as a collegiate basketball player, and even and in some cases in the, as a professional, you're kind of over a barrel. Things are not going well. Do I stop and leave and don't get my money and maybe now my reputation is messed up, or do I stay and fight through the nonsense and play well so that mm -hmm. I can play another year? Yeah. So it's not it's it's not always um, an easy decision, and it's even harder when you have a family. Mm -hmm. trying to juggle being a father and a husband and then being a professional athlete where, as we all know, all the, condi the conditions are not um, suitable all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are so many things, especially as an athlete, that you don't have control over. So it could be like if you're actually in a game, then the decision that a referee makes, you know, like maybe it comes out of nowhere. Maybe in your eyes, it's the wrong, wrong decision. Um, but then uh, even yeah. stuff... 
like f fans talking about how maybe you aren't playing the way that you're supposed to play, but every week you play in front of the same 10,000 people <coughs> who may or may not be saying bad things about you. So, yeah, and you know, if you're in a situation where you're the, the, the main player and counted on to do a lot of things in, in particular scoring, um, the, the, the educated fan will know, well, they're not exactly going to try to make it easy for Wendell. <laughs> so maybe that's why he's having a hard time. Yeah. You know, the uneducated fan, well, oh, he scored 30 points last week. Why he can't score 30 points this week? Yeah. Um, and then sometimes you're in a situation, and if your situation is different, sometimes you're, you find you, you, you have to coach yourself. <laughs> you have to figure <laughs> out, well, we can't run this play and we can't do that because we're doing this. So I have to do something different. I can't, I can't try and post up under the basket because they have one in front of me and one behind me. So I have to go out to the perimeter now and drive to the basket or shoot from outside. Um, yeah. and, 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 and many times those are, those are decisions you have to do on the fly or, and on your own and kind of live with the consequences because bottom line is you're trying to win. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of intricacies and, and underlying stories and things like that that people don't see. You know, They just see, well, you're playing basketball so you, and you can play good, so you should play good every game. Yeah, yeah. It was and, that uh, easy. And, and speaking of speaking of winning, um, you were very humble just now and kind of left out that part about when you uh, when you joined Alba Berlin and you won I think it was six titles in a row and won the MVP was it four times the league MVP four times I believe so yeah and um, mm -hmm. so basically for for six years in a row there was no way to to pass you or to win to win a title in Germany without passing you and no one was passing you so I remember those times they were they were awesome times because I was coming up playing basketball and I got to watch you in your prime basically mm -hmm. in the um, and and a lot of that again I I, I give credit to um, to timing mm. so much so much of it is timing um, because I've been in situations where, uh, for example, early in my career, I went from playing with Madrid and, you know, we're, we won the Corash, we won, we were, we're you know, fighting, our, our main competitor was Barcelona. And, you know, whether it's the Spanish Cup or the, the championship, we're in the finals against each other, beating each other's heads in. Mm -hmm. um, the following year, I go to a, a small town in Italy, um, you know, a team that, that struggled uh, just to get in the playoffs. And if they did, they didn't get very far. And I get there and, you know, everybody's 24, 25 and everything just clicks. And we go all the way to the finals and we're playing against D'Antoni and McAdoo uh -huh. in, in, in the finals. Um, and then the following year, we come crashing back to earth. So a lot of the success I think I had in Berlin had to do with a lot of the work that they did early, earlier. It was their time. Mm -hmm. I knew that they always ran into the Leverkusen or someone would get hurt that would derail their, their chances. Um, it was also, I think, a time where I had a lot of experience. And needless to say, playing for Pesic <laughs> is not something that everybody can do. <laughs> yes. But I had, I had enough experience as a player to know what I could do and what I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. so I was always doing enough that I had to do, but also making sure that I was ready to play on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so um, again, my, that, at that time I, I knew myself well, I knew what I had to do to be prepared. And, you know, I, I for one would, will admit that I never liked going to do training camp in December in the middle of the season when yeah. we had the winter break, we would go to, uh, the uh, Olympia, Olympia Stadium and running the running the track and the ice, <laughs> and I'm like, this is stupid. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. and uh, and you know, and yeah, run run you know run full speed on the track with the ice around the curb. Yeah, I was like, oh uh, no, I don't think so. So <laughs> it's always finding that happy medium of knowing, and that comes with experience. That comes over time, of knowing that the the effort that you put in in your training and your preparation is um, is important 
but more importantly, staying healthy and playing on Sunday is the ultimate goal. There's an awesome picture of you and uh, Pejic sitting in the back row of the bus after I, maybe it was the first title. Mm -hmm, you're, mm -hmm. you're shirtless, smoking a cigar, just <laughs> looking like you're loving life, and he's sitting next to you, just overjoyed about just winning the title. Right, that's one of right. my favorite was, pictures from that time. It was, it was. I think <laughs> I, I can remember that we won in Cologne, not Cologne, in Bonn. Mm -hmm. it was in, I think it was in Bonn. Our Possibly. first, our first, and it was an away game. And in that picture, we were going to the airport. And like you said, uh, I remember, I remember Henrik's face. I remember York. It was such like a sign of relief. You know, we've been trying for so long. We finally broke through. Yeah. And um, that, that, you know, as a, as a foreign player, you know, as an American, when you get in a situation like that, you're thankful because there's so many other times when, when you, when you fall short or you don't win, and you know, you always wonder, am I going to get a chance to be successful or or win that championship? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, being my fr my first year in Germany and given all the places that I've been, um, it's always refreshing to be in a place where they where they really um, not so much that they expected it, but that they were thankful and happy that they achieved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, know, you play for, you play for Madrid or you play for Maccabi, you know, from the beginning of the season, oh, you know, we should win the championship. Oh, we should win the championship. I'm like, it's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're in that position as a as the favorite. It makes it makes it a bit more difficult even. Right. Right. Um, so uh, let's fast forward a little bit. You uh you've you had a decorated career, you won six championships, and um then now you're the, the head of, is it corporate relations? Is that what your, your current position is? Right, I'm director of, of corporate partnerships for corporate partnerships. Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, which is in uh, New Jersey, the largest health system uh, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, this, is sort of, this is my second job, really. I, I started off in, in New York, in the Bronx. Um, this role is more of a, um, one that um, kind of fits me better mm -hmm. um, as the, and, and probably you see it out also out in, in California, most, um, most collegiate teams, most professional teams are aligned with a health system. So I'm trying to remember the clinic we used in Berlin when we would go to our like um, physical training mm -hmm. and we would have to get on the treadmill with the, with the mask on. Yeah. Um, or, or the, um, or for example, the, the, the children's clinic we would visit around the holidays. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can't remember the name, but I remember it was a children's hospital. Um, we, the, our system is the health official healthcare provider for many of the universities here in New Jersey, whether it be Rutgers, Seton Hall, um, Monmouth, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're all division one, but you know, one is Big Ten, one is Big East, another one is um, in, in another league, and we provide basically the the the, the health care as part of our agreement, a contract with them. We also do health and wellness uh, for the university staff, um, university students. Um, so uh, a, a large a large agreement, and and also with. Uh, you know, many of the the art and and um, musical centers uh, around the state. So health and wellness is something that can intertwine and connect with many different uh, specialties. And so through our office of corporate partnerships, that's where we work to connect with all the different organizations around the state. And um, I, I know that you um, you had like a, a few roles as I think in basketball coaching as an assistant coach, maybe. And, right. um, how did you transition into like what some people would call a, a real job, like a, a day job where you're mm -hmm. in the business world? How did that transition happen? Well, once I retired, um, obviously my natural inclination was to go into coaching, given my experience and the length of time that I played and 
my my idea was that I would, you know, become an assistant coach on a European team and, you know, work my way up, get my license, and then eventually become a head coach. Mm-hmm. So when I left uh, Weissenfels, uh, which, which of course didn't, didn't end well, I, I came back and I was still working out. I was probably 38, maybe 39 at the time. And, you know, could still play, maybe not 40 minutes, but at least 30. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I, have, I have one more year. I didn't like how last year felt. So long story short, you know, we're into September, we're into October, and you know, no one called. So mm-hmm. my son started high school, and, you know, I was going back and forth. And um, the, 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 the head coach of his school said, hey, you know, while you're still home, I know you're still looking to play, but while you're still home, would you would you be interested in working with uh, with our big guy? I'm like, your big guy? Who's your big guy? Oh, he says, oh, here, Andrew Bynum. I said, oh, sure. <laughs> I'll, work, I'll, I'll work out with Andrew Bynum. <laughs> so, you know, we, we long story short, um, I became the JV coach and then the assistant on the varsity of my son's high school team. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, uh, right soon after, and this is probably the, the end of the, the end of October, uh, I get a call from uh, Oldenburg, um, from uh, uh, what's his name? He combed his hair back the same way that uh, the coach from Leverkusen did. Don, 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 something. Uh, Don Beck. Don Beck. Don Beck, yeah. he was coaching in Oldenburg. Yeah. And he calls me and finds out if I wanted to play. And I'm like, figures you will call me a week after I said, mm-hmm. you know, start coaching. Well, so needless to say, I, I stayed with my commitment and I coached the team. The following year, um, I got introduced to a, a university, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark. Uh, mm-hmm. They were looking for a coach. Um, one of their administrators uh, worked at the school where my son went to. He mentioned me to the coach. We met, had a meeting, and there started my career in college. Um, that was a very humbling and uh, humbling experience because um, they were a Division II uh, mm-hmm. university. It's a technical school, so engineering, science, computer sciences, those kind of things. And the first thing I thought of, I'm like, if I'm studying computer science and I'm a basketball player, I'm not coming here. So, needless to say, um, it was it was a, a humbling experience in the sense that I had to wash uniforms and. Oh, yeah book hotel rooms and buses and but I, I again it was a learning experience I, I I embraced everything about it again it was it was basketball for me mm-hmm. I, I, I certainly had a lot more respect for Ica Marks uh, after, <laughs> after having to do all those things that uh, that he did and he made it look so easy yeah um, and and I coached there for a couple of years uh, the coach eventually um, was fired, and that's when I, I um, went for the the program with the with the G League. Um, they had a they had a coaches seminar, and I never forget the coaches were Rick Carlisle, Dwayne Casey, and Terry Stotts. It's not too bad. And so obviously the three of them were out of jobs. And, you know, in, in talking with them and joking around, they basically had a agreement <laughs> that said, you know, whichever one of them got a, uh, a head coaching job, he would hire the other two. Mm-hmm. So as you could recall, and I think Dwayne, Stott, Dwayne Casey and, and Terry Stotts were on the Dallas Mavericks when they won the championship. Mm-hmm. Um, so nonetheless, that was a great experience working there. And, and I ended up uh, getting a job with the uh, Austin Toros, which are the um, G League team of San Antonio Spurs. 
Mm -hmm. uh, lived down in Austin for a year. And it was that, at that time, I think it was 2009, um, when I came to like a crossroad. Uh, you know, I, I was retired for five years now, went from, you know, high school to G League and, you know, was deciding whether I will continue coaching or, or go into another field. And, you know, the offer to go into healthcare, which I knew was a uh, growing field, especially in the States. And actually my mother was a nurse and my aunt was an administrator and, um, you know, spoke with them about it. And, um, you know, made the, made the jump from coaching to, to healthcare. And so here we are, ooh, maybe 10, 12 years later, yeah. uh, you know, here, here, here we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I mean, obviously you, you've kind of risen through the ranks again now at, at the director level. Um, so it really, this is exactly where, where my, everything that I'm trying to do right now is, is tying mm -hmm. into is um, I kind of want to spotlight how former professional athletes, they bring these certain attributes and what we call in the professional field transferable skills, which is like one of the buzzwords at the moment, right? Every right. job interview, they will ask you for your transferable skills. And um, so you, you kind of already got into some of them, but um, like if you maybe, maybe like the top five transferable skills that professional athletes bring to the table that make them basically great hires for any kind of organization mm -hmm. outside of sports. Um, I think the first one I put at the top of the list is resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, ability, to com ability to communicate. Um, I would I would say work ethic. Mm -hmm. Ability to work with ability to work with people from different specialties of different um, special backgrounds. Backgrounds. Yeah. Okay. And I think at, the, at probably number one will be um goal oriented yeah cool and i mean obviously there's there's tons more i kind of put you on the spot now but <laughs> uh, yeah. so yeah thank you thank one you thing, for that huh? one thing I, I would say in you know my old well you know now my oldest son you know i always stressed in him to always have a plan you know it's uh and, and to his credit, he 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 followed it, and um, and he he would be the first one to tell you his his road uh, to professional career was was uh, was rockier than mine. Um, you know, he had he had the fortune of being injured, and then also not being able to play at uh you know at one place. But if you're if you're a professional player and you're Thinking about coaching, um, you know, one of the things I think that you have to do, coaching is, is, is based on a lot of uh, networking and, and relationships. Yeah. And, you know, especially if you, I mean, if you're playing in the NBA, that's one thing. But if you're playing overseas uh, and you're planning on, you know, coaching after your career is over, you have to connect with high school, college, or, you know, some, some, coaching entity or coaching group that will sort of um, help you transition from professional to coaching, mm -hmm. working at right. camps, working at camps, working at, uh, um, you know, attending seminars, if they happen to happen over the summer uh, or when, you know, when you're around, you know, keeping that, keeping that line of communication, that line of um, availability is, is important. And even and even if you're not, um, never never let like I said never let the phone line go cold. You know, always keep in touch with um, 
you know, people that you value, people that you, not so much that you can get something from, but that you know are at least aware of what's going on, who can be your, your source of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I point out, athletes make, one of, the, one of the specialties athletes make good transitions to is into education, the educational field. Um, you know, working at the public school level, high school level, even college level. Um, many universities, a lot of times, hire their former athletes because of the fact that they're part of the culture. They know the university well. They've been through the the um, you know the the student athlete experience, and so no one better. <laughs> Than a former athlete, former student athlete, maybe five, six, ten years removed, but still it's valuable for them to relate that experience to a, to a newer one, a one that's going through it. The challenges of, of balancing academics and athletics. Um, I remember even when I remember to this day um, when I played, when I was playing in Berlin, and Jan Yagla was debating whether to go to college or to play continue playing in, in, in Alba mm -hmm. or, play, or playing in Germany for that matter. And I told him, I said, college is going to give you experience you can't get playing, you know, here. It, yeah. it, it gives yeah. you a time to grow. It allows you to work on your game. It allows you to do a lot of things that, frankly, here, you know, you're going to go to school and you're going to, and you're going to play and then you're going to feel the pressure of, you know, getting to the first team. Yeah. So, and and he went on to go to uh, to Penn State, <clears throat> right, right, and had a had a pretty good career at at Penn State also. So yes, yes, one of his assistants um, was my graduate assistant at Syracuse. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> um, and and Jan knows who we talking about, uh, Rick Callahan. So to this day. I mean, I saw Rick maybe uh, a few weeks ago, but he coaches here in New Jersey. So, you know, we stay in touch and we get to see each other, uh, you know, a lot and uh, through Syracuse connection. And then I, I go down and see some of his games at Monmouth. But it's funny, again, the basketball world is very small. Yeah. So, you know, you might know a coach that was somebody else's coach that somebody played for. And it goes back to, to networking and all right. And, yeah, right. exactly. It's it's great that you already went into this because my last question actually would have been what your advice would be to um, like to to athletes who are transitioning either from the college level or the pro level into right. the like the job world. But um, and, you already and, went. And, and and I think now more so at this current time, um, the world has gotten smaller with the internet, and as we can see now with Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, if you're an athlete that's playing professionally, either in the States or in Europe, there's no reason that you can't, other than, other than yourself, there's no reason why you can't uh, further your education or finish your education. Yeah. You know, if, you use, if you use your time wisely, I mean, you can, you know, you can go to class, get your MBA online while you're, while you're playing overseas mm -hmm. and, and do it at, you know, and do it at a pace that's comfortable for you. You know, Absolutely. Back, back when I was playing, you, you had to physically be on campus, which was, yeah. you know, only during the summertime. Um, that's why, as I wrote it on the LinkedIn, I made it a point that I <clears throat> was going to get out and, and during my time during the four years. Um, because I was, I was the first one in my family to go to college. And, you know, just personally for me, I always feel, you know, I'm going to I'm going to finish what I start. Um, you know, some people say, oh, well, you could, you know, come back later and finish it. It's like, no, no, I want to get it done in the time I'm supposed to get it done. Mm -hmm. And, okay. um, you know, that, that allowed me now, that allowed me rather then to um, mentally move on knowing I accomplished that. That was my main goal of getting my degree. And then now my experience, um, or my European experience, as I, as I mentioned, um, help me continue to grow and, 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 and expand. Mm -hmm. um, one of, like, one of the things that I would always say about former athletes is that under pressure, they always perform very well. 
because they're used to an, like an entire different environment of pressure. And um, so there's, I don't know if you know, but you are, kind of have uh, like a mythological status in Germany, if not for everything else, for this one video that I'm about to show you. It's the, I think it's the third game of the finals against Bonn. You're playing in uh, Max Schmillinghalle in Berlin. And it's that, uh, that infamous, I think it's a game winning three from the right wing and you pull up your shorts just before. Oh, mm -hmm. You get the deflection, you pull up your shorts and you knocked out three. <laughs> so um, if I can get this to work, then let me show you. Yeah, it should be work. Should work. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. I hope the sound works. <laughs> Oh, and that's uh, Marco Baldi, who was right, right. The I think already the CEO back then, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a ge the general manager at least then. Yep. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> I I was uh, that was that was from the um, the ceremony in Berlin. I heard, uh, I heard the background music. Yeah, yeah, you were. I think you. Uh, that was the the third game, and you won the series three zero, and right. uh, this was the dagger basically. And for whenever someone says the name Wendell Alexis in connection to German basketball, everyone oh. always brings up this story, and oh, that's yeah. like the the, what, the symbolism the, of why you're the Ice Man, you know? Yeah, one of the one of the reporters <laughs> one of the reporters it was long after that. And he says, oh, you remember that play? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Because the guy, the point guard, Mark, uh, I forgot his last name. I think his first name was Mark. He, when I stole the ball, he, he, grabbed, he grabbed my, my, my shorts mm -hmm. to not, you know, for me not to get to the ball. And so I, I, I felt my shorts like if I take one more step, they're going to come down. <laughs> so that's why I let the ball roll. And I'm watching it, and that's why I adjusted my shorts. But then when I got to the ball, my momentum was 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 going forward, and whenever I shoot, I always take a hop to get into my shot. So the referee says, "Oh, did did you walk? Is that isn't that a walk?" And so I said, "Let me ask you this: You remember Michael Jordan's last shot? Not to compare <laughs> myself to Jordan or anything, but he had a shot against Byron Russell, and he and he, you know, helped helped Byron along with his with his right yeah. hand." I said, "Was that a foul?" Well, it, 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 it was a foul, but they didn't call a foul. I said, exactly. So it was a walk and they didn't call walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's so like for, for any, anybody who asks if, um, if athletes know how to perform under pressure, then obviously this is one of the greatest videos to show because you're doing it on one end, getting the deflection, getting the steal. Then the mm -hmm. guy actually commits a flagrant foul by by grabbing your shorts, right. which could, could be a, a flagrant foul and two free throws and the ball, right. but you you persevere kind of you push through, mm -hmm. and uh, with with all the cool in the world, pick up the ball and knock down the three. You guys win the championship. So that's uh, yeah. yeah. That's also my dad also told me to to show you this video because he loves it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was like I said, it's one of those things that. Um, when you look back on it and you know when you when you started the clip i i i was i remembered it in my head and i said you know they ran they ran that same play maybe two or three times earlier during the game and um like all players will tell you 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 know when you play long enough you you, you um you remember certain little things that Oh yeah, I gotta remember this because they do that, and maybe I can get the ball. But this is this is one of those plays. Oh, that that was an instance where I said, you know, now is now is the time because I think I, if I remember correctly, at that point we were, we were down, and um, 
you know, the, the possibility of going back to Bond was not <laughs> one that we, we wanted to do. And um, so we were like, no, we're here, we're at home and we want to end it right here. And um, like I said, luckily I was able to make a, make a play. And I think Marco had just hit a three, maybe the, the trip down the floor before that, Marco uh, Pezic. Marco Pezic, right. Yeah, so you guys were, were uh, like it was a come from behind victory and obviously at Max Schmielinghausen, so everybody was going crazy over that. Right, right. And yeah, that was that, a great, great time. Heated rivalry between us and Bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, um, let, me, let me stop the recording, by the way.